This is Major League Baseball Magazine, brought to you by Frito-Lay. ESPN presents Major League Baseball Magazine. This week's cover story, former Yankee Ralph Terry now makes his pitch on the Senior Tour. Oh boy, I like that. Beautiful shot. Great shot. We'll feature a Father's Day special with a third generation on the threshold of the majors. I think I could be a valuable utility man in the major leagues, and, and that's what I'm shooting for. And we'll give you the dirt on a bootleg variation of the old soft shoe. This is the side straddle hop. One, two, thank you. Very good. This is Warner Fusell for Major League Baseball Magazine. Presented by Ruffles Light, Cheetos Light, and Doritos Light. Never give up the taste. For Ralph Terry, pitching with the New York Yankees in the early 1960s was such a joyous experience, there was even music in mistakes. I'll never forget Yankee Stadium, uh, the sound of the ball when somebody hit a, a home run or a long ball, it had a different ring to it. Uh, somebody said it's sort of like playing in an opera house with a high grandstand. But for all his success, Ralph was destined to be remembered for one pitch in the 1960 World Series. It was like a uh, slow pitch softball game with the wind blowing out. It was a hitter's day. It uh, looked like who would, whoever had last at bats uh, had a big advantage. And I came out, I got the last out in the uh, bottom of the eighth. And uh, came out in the ninth and threw two pitches, both of them high. First one for a ball. and. Uh, and I got the next one down about belt high, which wasn't quite low enough. And Maz hit it uh, right out of the park on the line, and uh, they, uh, the people went crazy. Here's a swing and a high fly ball going deep left. Mazeroski's home run was one of baseball's greatest moments, as Ralph is often reminded. Like the time he was in Europe and a man struck up a friendly conversation. They tell me you played a bit of rounders, and I said, that's, that's correct. And he proceeds to tell me that he's seen one game in his life, and in 1960 he was in Pittsburgh. And so my ears perked up, and. Uh, I thought maybe somebody was putting him up to this. And uh, so he says, we played our 18 in the morning at Oakmont, and our host, U.S. Steel, said, we must make haste. We are going to see one of America's classics, the seventh game of the World Series. He said, the place was absolutely mobbed. And he says, in the final chucker, this bloke hit it clean out of the lot. <laughs> and sheer pandemonium broke loose. We were lucky to escape with our lives. <laughs> so it was the uh, strangest thing to hear an Englishman describe this. It's the only game he's ever seen. And uh, I said, you know, WD, somebody had to throw the ball up to that guy. He said, yes, yes. I said, that was me. I threw the pitch. 
Oh, what a coincidence. More pork. And we had a little celebration right there. Of course, the next two years, the Yankees won the series. And in 62, Ralph won 23 games and was series MVP. I was just thankful to get a, uh, an opportunity, uh, win or lose, to redeem myself. You know, most guys, uh, if you have a bad seventh game or a bad event in your life, a big loss, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times you're, you're stuck with that. At least I was able to bury that ghost and bury those things by, by winning one. And, and, of course, I was fortunate to win uh, in the uh, seventh game. Uh, ended up one nothing, and the Giants had two men on, and McCovey lined out to Richardson at, at, at second for the final out. That was about as tense a situation as I ever had. And, and it's one of the best games I ever pitched, and, again, I was fortunate to win it. Ralph stopped pitching in 1967 and took his turn at hitting for a change, something all pitchers should probably take on. For Ralph, it was the natural extension of a love he picked up through a friend. I got to playing as therapy and loved it right away. It was so much fun and I couldn't play very well. I, I got back with the Yankees and Mantle invited me to play a couple of times. They were short a player and, and he'd give me two shots on a par five and a, one shot on the four pars and, and pretty soon I wasn't getting any shots and, and, and uh, we, used to, we used to have some good matches. For Ralph, sneaking in a game of golf while with the Yankees was in itself a fine art. I got to the ballpark and I had a golfer's suntan. My arms are kind of red here in my neck. And so everybody knew I was playing golf. And Ralph Houck was the manager. He called me in the office. He said, did you play golf today? And I figured he knew something. I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, I've had five, five phone calls telling me you played golf today. And he said, you know it's a $500 fine. I said, yeah, that's right. You know. But I said, it just serves to relax me a little bit. The next day, we traveled. I had a late game and left L.A. and traveled all night. And I pitched the next game. And I pitched a two-hitter and won two to nothing. And uh, it made my record at that time 11 and one. So <laughs> Ralph called me in the office and he said, you know, this is your first offense. He said, I'm going to overlook this. All right. Lucky Yankees. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Ralph is just as serious about golf as he was about baseball, and has joined the pro ranks on the senior tour. I went through the, the school uh, a year ago and got my card. They give out eight eight cards every year, and whereas on the regular tour they give out 50 cards, so it's very difficult to get a, to get a card out here. And, and in fact, I got in in a playoff. There were three of us for the last two spots. And that was about as intense pressure as playing in the World Series. It's either a, it's a stiff wind, you know, maybe a little six or seven, you know, a little, little six or a good seven. I'll say the seven. You like the seven? Like All righty. Knock it down, that's probably the best. Casey could inspire a ball player. You know, he could really, during the, you know, when the game was really close and on the line, why, he could, uh, he was a real leader. You know, he'd get up on the dugout steps and he'd say, come on, let's go, let's go get him. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. I don't really, I don't really need it, but I, of course I have it. <laughs> Thank you. That's what happened to my arm. <laughs> Big wind up, no pitch, nothing on it. I got a ringside seat here in golf, like in, in baseball, and I see, I see Palmer and Trevino and Chi Chi and Gary and uh, Nicholas, and, and you can feel it. You can sense it being around them. I mean, they can make things happen on the golf course. It's just like. You know, Mantle and uh, Maris and Whitey Ford and these guys, they walk out there and uh, they can win the big games. They can arise to the occasion. Although he hasn't risen to attorney title yet, 
Other pros admire Ralph for both his present and his past. He gave me a tip on my screwball. He told me I was throwing it a little bit too much with the shoulder, so I got to throw it more with the, with the arm and the elbow. And he's breaking a lot better. Changing one sport to another is uh, phenomenal. I mean, and he's very well coordinated. And uh, I like Ralph's swing. He's got a real smooth golf swing. He's got a good putting stroke. So listen up to the left. All right, come down sideways. Yeah, yeah, rolling in the hole. Keep coming, come keep on. coming in the hole. Come on. Come on. Welcome. <laughs> right side. I couldn't see the, see the top of the flag. How can you not have Roger Maris in the Hall of Fame? Two-time uh, MVP, and he has the all-time home run record, and yep. it's been 30 years. And still no one's come within eight or nine home runs of that. I mean, anytime anybody starts hitting home runs, they start comparing it to Roger Maris. And, and the man's not in the Hall of Fame. Boy, I like that. Beautiful shot. Great shot. Some men dream of playing in a World Series, and some of playing Nicholas. And then there's Ralph Terry. You know, baseball came a little easier for me. Golf is uh, not my natural game. I don't think it's, I don't think golf is easy for anybody. <laughs> but we love it. <laughs> In the news, music at the ballpark. The perfect filler between innings. But sometimes it sneaks up on you. I think when you get to the major leagues, you pretty much have your profile as a hitter down. Because guys usually do what they've been successful doing in the minor leagues. They don't come to the major leagues and switch if they've been very successful in the minor leagues. So it's going to take some talking to and talking through to get Dave Magadan to change his mindset. What oh, music now. Somebody's <laughs> got some rock and roll fired out here on the PA system here. They play, it in. They play, <laughs> what's going on here? They play some pretty good music between innings, but I never Shea heard disco. it. Wow, somebody was hitting. <laughs> but if renegade music gives baseball a bum rap, what begets mud dancing? This is the side straddle hop. One, two, thank you. Very good. Huh? That might be a new hit. I mean, the Lombada and uh, stranger things have happened. Of course, you have to have a mound in the middle of the dance floor. There's no take me out to the ball game here. Instead, it's a bunch of aerobics instructors that lead the crowd in a cheer of OK Blue Jay, let's play ball. <laughs> and Gary Gaetti thought he'd join in. <laughs> All players are athletic, but precious few are photogenic. We were mentioning the other day that in the Royals dressing room and the A's dressing room, there's a poster promoting Kansas City Royals baseball. Well, oddly enough, it is showing a picture of a guy in that uniform right there. That's a Royals uniform. Does that look familiar to you? Well, if it doesn't, maybe we can switch it here and you'll see that it is a familiar face. That's Walt Weiss in an A's uniform, the original picture right there. And then they flip it back and they just draw a Royals uniform on him and use that exciting action shot to promote Royals baseball. Photo ops, phantom music, flying feet, and physics. Baseball, the lighter side. Two balls, one strike. What? Um... <laughs> this is Southern California, folks. They're flying you in your beer, I can see, for it. <laughs> oh, my. I don't know who they're sending that one to. <laughs> I guess they haven't heard of fax machines out here yet. <laughs> Now, 
It all began with Mike Tresh, a catcher with the White Sox. He had a son named Tom, who hooked up with the Yankees. And now, baseball's on the verge of a Tresh trifecta, if Tom's son, Mickey, can make it to the majors. It'd be neat for the family, because I know the baseball's been so important to the Tresh family. And uh, more than it for me being, you know, the third, uh, the first third generation, I just thought it'd be neat to have the Tresh name in the books as, as being a special family in baseball. It was Mike who got things started in 1938 as a rock behind the plate. My dad was a very durable player. He was called Iron Mike. One season he caught every game that the Chicago White Sox played during the regular season. He was more of a defensive catcher. In those days they didn't really worry whether a catcher hit a whole lot or they didn't. Their main job was to handle the pitching staff. Uh, and uh, he was considered a, a master of that. Mike passed on his work ethic and skills to son Tom, who was Rookie of the Year in 1962, and thinks Dad had something to do with it. It's a great thing, I think, for a young kid to grow up with a father being in the major leagues. You know your dad's special because everybody pays attention to him and, and yourself. And um, I guess I, you, know, you come on baseball naturally as a result of that. I had the advantage of learning uh, all the techniques, uh, the fundamentals of baseball correctly. He had taught me everything he knew, and, uh, and I, tried to, I tried to carry those things out. My dad was a player that said, hey, you play when you're hurt. You play uh, wherever the manager wants you to play, and that's... That's the way you play baseball, and I tried to do that. For Tom, the 62 World Series had a Father's Day feel. Not only was it my first World Series and my first season, but uh, my dad was in the stands, and my dad had played 12 years in the major leagues and was never able to be in a World Series. And so he was kind of playing it on uh, with me. And uh, so it was a great thrill to go back in the, the locker room after that moment and have my dad share it with me. The earliest thing I remember is a father-son game in Tiger Stadium when I was five, but I don't remember watching him. I've seen clips and I've seen him swing and play and, and uh, I see he was a good ball player. And from, especially since I've been in pro ball, I've heard coaches talk about him and, and they just tell me how great of a ball player he really was and what a great person he was too and that really makes me proud. Mickey's quest to make his dad proud began with the Yankees, but he's now with the Tigers and has something to prove. I don't think I was satisfied with the chance I got with the Yankees, and, and, and so I would have really struggled with a decision to quit when they released me. I would, have, I would have thought I hadn't given it my best shot. It's a lot of pressure for him. I, he wants it bad, and uh, it's, it's hard on him when he makes twice as much in the winter as, a, as an accountant with uh, Deloitte Touche. Uh, and uh, he goes away to play minor league baseball and is making you know, these ridiculous salaries. The kid really has to want it. He's sacrificed and, and he's not willing to give it up yet. I've given him all the credit in the world. A lot of people would back off of that. When, you're, when your dad was a major league player and your grandfather was a major league player, it's easier to play golf or something like that, you know, than to say, oh, I'm going to try to do it too. Because that's, that's a big challenge and uh, it's, it sets you up for uh, a good chance of failure. But Mickey thrives on playing in the shadow of his father and is playing every day for Lakeland in the Florida State League. And though he may not have the talent of his namesake, Mickey Mantle, he has the will of a Tresh. Ever since I was a young kid, my dad's taught me to play the game hard, and that's, that's the only way there is to play it. One thing my grandfather always said to my dad is, uh, everybody can hustle. And, um, you know, if you're not hustling, then that's one step, one strike against you that the next guy can have, and everybody can hustle, so you should at least do that. He's done an outstanding job for us at Lakeland. He's a very intense young man, uh, good hard-nosed player, and uh, has helped us in that he's got some versatility. He's filled in at left field. We needed somebody and put him out there, and he, he did a well of a job. Only time will tell as to how far he'll go. I think I've got what it takes to be in the major leagues. A talent I have is that I have a lot of versatility. I can do a lot of things. I can play a lot of positions and I think I could be a valuable utility man in the major leagues, and, and that's what I'm shooting for. And Until I start believing that I can't be that, then uh, I'll still be playing.
This ESPN program is brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. Remember, know when to say when. For Pittsburgh pitcher Neil Heaton, the big leagues had been unspectacular. More losses than wins. More trade rumors each year. Well, the first seven years was a struggle, and uh, yeah. when I was first brought into the major leagues, I was uh, very stubborn. You know, I didn't want to listen to too many coaches, and I found out, because I had a lot of success in uh, high school and college. I was an All-American for three years, and I had to learn that pro ball was a little bit different, and I learned, uh, and I feel like now I'm finally adjusted, and I'm, and I'm ready to go. Heaton's resurgence began late last year, thanks to a newfound pitch with a name that covers all the bases. Well, I call it the screw knuckle change because, number one, I turn it over like a screwball. I hold it like a knuckle curveball, and it's an off-speed pitch, and that's the pitch that's turned me around this year so far. It, it keeps the hitters honest. The hitters don't have to sit on just that one fastball anymore. It's pretty nasty. It seems to do everything the pitch describes, the screw knuckle change. It has a little bit of that and a little bit of a knuckle to it. And it takes a pitch at you on the way there, and it's got a little bit of everything. It's a screw. Screw and a knuckle and a change. And the only thing it does is makes the hitter miss the ball. It sounds simple, but it's enabled Heaton to forge a 9 1 record and accept his success with the wisdom of the years that came before. I go out there every fifth day, I stay healthy and I'm consistent and, and get the team at least into the seventh inning. As far as wins and losses concerned, you can't control that because you know how baseball is. You get so many tangibles that, um, you know, take the place of that and uh, you just have to go out there and be consistent and the winds will fall into place. During his eight years in the American League, Tom Brunanski hit Fenway Park like he owned it. After two years in St. Louis, he now gets to call Fenway home. He hammers this to deep left field. Cleared everything out there. He goes deep toward right field. And into the bullpen for a home run. A three-run homer for Tom Brunanski. Five for five. And seven runs batted in. High drive left field. Up and away she goes for a home run for Brunanski. Seven to one. He will get the stand-up welcome after hitting the homer in one of his favorite ballparks. I was managing, I had a lot of Latin ball players, and uh, for the first time we pulled up the bus into, uh, into uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and one of the Latin players didn't know what the, uh, what the little cellophane thing was. Uh, you know, they give you a, a fork and a knife and, a, and one of those wipe, uh, you know, towelette things, and uh, one of the uh, other ball players told him that it was secret sauce, so what he was doing is he was grabbing his, uh, his drumstick and he was rubbing that, uh, that moist towel all over, his, uh, all over his chicken, thinking it was some kind of a secret sauce. We're near Lake Michigan, so it's kind of a fun place. It can be hot one minute, cold the next. One afternoon, we were playing a ball game that started about 85 degrees. The umpire behind home late started the game without his jacket on. About the seventh inning, the wind changed, came in off the lake. Temperature dropped about 30 degrees. As the temperature dropped, the quality of the umpiring behind home plate also dropped. So I went out about the eighth inning to make a pitching change, and I went by the umpire, and I said, geez, you, you miss your coat? He says, boy, I sure do. I said, well, it fits the rest of your game. You missed everything else all day long. I was gone. Mickey Rivers one time after a game went four for four and he was of course uh, surrounded by the media in the locker room. He had on a fraternity shirt and in the course of eating and giving an interview one of the writers went to Mickey and they said, Mickey, uh, and they looked at his shirt and they said, is that Sigma Chi Epsilon? And he looked down and he said, no, it's lasagna.
on deck for next week, the meanest cat in baseball. This is Warner Fusell. Major League Baseball Magazine is presented by Ruffles Light, Cheetos Light, and Doritos Light. Never give up the taste.